Our commissioners are very appreciative of the collaborative efforts that have been made by so many. And there's no way that we could uh, name all those um, nonprofits, individuals that have worked together to get us to the point we're at today. But the last thing I, I leave you with in my welcoming remarks is, and it will probably be said many times here today and continue to be said, that all of us are affected by substance use in some way, whether it's a family member or it's just a friend down the road or if you are serving in a public office or in public service in some way, uh, we hear it all the time. And there are so many situations, and at times they, they seem, you know, um, what can we do to help? And oftentimes we don't know exactly the correct words to express. But I believe in what we're doing here in Craven County now, across North Carolina and across this United States of America, that we are beginning to bring, if not anything else, bring awareness to this uh, tragic problem that we have and we will continue to fight together to combat it. Again, we thank you for your attendance today. We look forward to all those that will be speaking. And uh, at this time, I'm going to ask if our opioid program manager, uh, Colonel Eric Lund, will come forward. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman, thank you, Commissioners, and thank you all for being here, all y'all. Um, good evening. I'm uh, Colonel Eric Lund. I joined Craven County, as you heard, uh, Opioids Epidemic Response Department as Program Manager in October. So I'm one of the very newest, if not the newest, of this wonderful team. And I've gotten to know uh, what a difference uh, three and a half months makes. I, I actually I actually know m almost all of you in the room, except uh, for a handful, but that's a good thing, and uh, we're, we're making connections and, and making improvement. A tremendous amount of opioid-related data, data from a multitude of sources exists, so I could keep you here all night going over uh, every st statistic. But I have tried to narrow it down to some of the most relevant data points to help understand the scope of the opioid epidemic here in Craven County. Drug overdose deaths are on the rise in Craven County. Eighty-three of our residents died from a drug overdose in 2022. In 2021, the number was 64. The year before, it was 52. 2019, it was 45, and 2018, it was 34. It's easy to get lost in the in numbers, but ultimately, there are 278 Craven County residents we have lost over the last five years to drug overdose. And 558, we have lost since the year 2000. These are, are not just numbers on the chart. These lost lives are those of children, parents, friends, and coworkers, as, as the chairman discussed. Craven, Craven County went from an average of one drug overdose every 73 days in 2000 to one drug overdose every 21 days, 11 hours in 2014. And in 2022, we're at one drug overdose every four days and 10 hours. Not only are drug overdose deaths on the rise in Craven County, but accidental drug overdose deaths are also on the rise. 94% of drug overdoses in Craven 
from 2017 to 2022 were unintentional compared to 74% being unintentional from five years prior, 2012 to 2016. The metrics provided by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Injury and Prevention Branch include deaths of all intents involving all types of medications and drugs to include prescription opioids, heroin, and fentanyl. 2022 death da data are provisional and likely to increase as cases are finalized. This chart provided by the North Carolina Division of Public Health based upon the North Carolina State Center for Health Statistics shows the progression of substances contributing to overdose deaths in Craven County residents from 2012 to 2022. It is important to note that each death in this ch chart is not mutually exclusive, meaning that if a person who died had more than one substance contributing to their death, they are included in the count shown for each substance. The green line shows overdose deaths from prescription opioid medications in Craven started to increase after 2012, while overdose deaths from heroin and or fentanyl shown by the navy blue line were extremely low. As overdose deaths from prescribed opioid medications began to decrease after 2013, you can see the heroin and fentanyl deaths, the navy blue line, gradually rise until 2014, when they were both on the rise and intersected in 2015. And by, <clears throat> and by 2016, overdose deaths from heroin and fentanyl surpassed the number of overdose deaths from prescribed opioids. After 2016, overdose deaths from prescription opioids began to decline, while deaths from heroin and fentanyl have continued to increase exponentially. And you can see that there. While Craven County's drug overdose death rate per 100,000 citizens is higher than the counties to, whom, to which we routinely compare ourselves, the upward trend of overdose deaths over the last three years is not isolated to Craven alone. Craven County residents made 172 visits to the emergency department, the ED, for opioid overdose-related care in 2023. This was a decrease, this is a good news story, a decrease of 11% compared to the 194 visits in 2022. However, our rate of 168.4 opioid overdose ED visits per 100,000 citizens is still in the top 10 highest rates in North Carolina. This is an average of one person making an ED visit for opioid overdose every two days and three hours. Some other good news is when we received reports this month, opioid overdose ED visits by for the month of December 23, decreased by 29% compared to the same month in 2022. The number of opioid overdose visits decreased from a count of 17 to 12 for that month. Excuse me. From July 2022 to June of 2023, Craven County had 278 emergency medical services, EMS, encounters for suspected opioid overdose, an average of one such encounter every one day and eight hours. Our rate of 272.2 EMS suspected Opioid overdose encounters per 100,000 residents is in the top three highest rates in North Carolina. Some good news is that EMS encounters for suspected opioid overdoses decreased 
by 9% when compared to the comp when comparing the count of 129 encounters from January to June of 2023 with the 143 encounters from January to June of 2022. Some other good news, of the 129 suspected opioid overdose encounters during the first six months of 2023, naloxone, or Narcan, was administered to 125 of the encounters. And 120 of the, 121, pardon me, of those had an improved response to the naloxone. Provisional data shows 66 people who died in Craven County from November 2022 to October 2023 tested positive for fentanyl when toxicology testing was done. The presence of fentanyl at the time of death does not necessarily indicate fentanyl as the cause of death. However, our rate of 65.4 fentanyl positive deaths for 100,000 residents is in the top five highest rates in North Carolina counties. That is a lot of data to process, and it does not necessarily capture the complete scope of the problem or the real day-to-day -day stories of the struggles our citizens are facing due to the opioid epidemic. We use the data as indicators of areas where we need to work hard or areas where we can celebrate making improvements to save lives. The goal is to save lives. The goal is to improve lives. If we can do that, we improve the quality of life in so many ways for all in Craven County. Thank you. I now am going to turn the presentation over to Amber Parker, Human Resources Director. Looks like this thing's gonna be a challenge all night. Good evening, I'm Amber Parker and I'm the Human Resources Director for Craven County, but I also oversee our opioid epidemic response. Colonel Lund shared a lot of data with you to indicate the problem we're facing in Craven County. And Craven County's opioid epidemic response department is still currently in the development process and we hope when we present this program to you next year that we're going to have some positive results to share. But know that real change is going to take time. Real change is going to take a lot of effort. Real change is going to take doing things differently than we're doing things right now. Real change is going to take a lot of money. I'm here to talk about that money. The funding that we have available to help us in making our way to real change. To date, North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein has announced securing more than $56 billion through nationwide agreements with opioid manufacturers and distributors for opioid-related misconduct, for doing things such as failing to adequately warn about addiction risks, to fail to warn about overprescribing and encouraging overprescribing. That figure was approximately $54 billion when we held this meeting in June of 2023. The settlement funds are to help communities harmed by the opioid epidemic to provide treatment, recovery, harm reduction, and other life-saving programs and services. Approximately $1.4 billion will come to the state of North Carolina and to local governments to address the epidemic. 15% of that money will stay with the state and 85% will go to all of Craven County's 100 counties, as well all of the state's 100 counties, as well as 17 municipalities with populations over $75,000, 75,000 people, goodness, who joined the lawsuit. A, memor a memorandum of agreement between the state of North Carolina and local governments, referred to as the MOA, directs how all opioid settlement funds are to be budgeted, distributed, and accounted for. And that covers all waves of settlement, as well as bankruptcies. So here's what's important. Craven County's portion of the opioid settlement funds is going to be roughly $15.6 million and will receive that over 18 years. Just to show the progression, this number was $15.5 million when we held this meeting in June. 
This chart shows the current payment schedule Craven County can expect. The payment schedule is front loaded to provide higher levels of funding in the beginning of those 18 years, and then it'll gradually decrease until we receive our last payment in fiscal year 2038, 2039, and that amount will be $379,943. $379, so as you can see, that is going to go down when you look at what we're currently funding our program at. To date, Craven County has received $1,768,514 in opioid settlement funds, and we're anticipating that figure to reach roughly $3.3 million by the end of this fiscal year. So the MOA, it includes five broad requirements that all recipients of the opioid settlement funds are required to follow by. First, we have to establish a special fund. This was completed by Craven County in fiscal year 23-24 budget. And what's important is that these funds can carry over from year to year. We're not required to spend them in the year that we receive them, but they cannot be commingled with any other funds. We're also required to authorize the spending in advance. And we're required to do that through the budgeting process as well as a special resolution that has specific language in it. It has to state specifically that it is an authorization for the expenditure of opioid settlement funds. It has to state the strategy. It has to include the number of the strategy from the Exhibit A or B of the MOA. It has to show the amount authorized and the time period those funds have to be spent. The MOA also requires recipients to understand and follow options A and B remediation activities. And Jasmine is going to share more information with you about that shortly. We're also required to follow their reporting requirements. We must submit the expenditure authorizations within 90 days and we are required to submit annual financial reports and annual impact reports for each strategy funded within 90 days of the end of the fiscal year. The MOA also requires all recipients to hold at least one annual meeting each year where we have all municipalities provide input to the county on the proposed usage of those funds. And that meeting has to be open to the public. That's why we're here today. We're completing that requirement. Of course, we're not providing our program in isolation. We're part of many different collaboratives, and we've invited other partners to share impact and input with us here today. The MOA is going to remain in effect for Craven County until one year after the last date in which we receive opioid settlement funds. So if we get our last funds in fiscal year 28, 20, 30, 38, 39, then the MOA should cease to be effective in June 30th of 2040. So the MOA gives us two options, and these are the strategies we have to choose from. Option A gives local governments the option to fund strategies that are on a shorter list of evidence-based high-impact strategies, and we can choose from those without doing any other pre-planning work. And then also to select from a longer list of Option B strategies, we have to first complete a 14-step collaborative strategic planning process, and that is outlined in MOA Exhibit C. Happy to say that we are currently in the process of completing that strategic collaborative planning process with our partner RAI. And we hope to have results of that to present to our Board of Commissioners for consideration this spring. Next, I'm going to have Jasmine Kennedy, our Outreach Coordinator, talk about MOA options A and B and the related strategies. Thank you, Amber. As Amber stated, I will be going over the option A and option B strategies. For those of you that would like to follow along, I will be referring to the documents that you found at the rounded tables. And for as the chairs out there in the audience, there were some option A documents spread across and as well as some option B documents. Beginning with option A, we have strategic planning. Under this strategy, we can use funds to support collaborative strategic planning, as Amber discussed, to address opioid misuse, including staffing support or facilitation services. Number two, we have evidence-based addiction treatment. Now, under this strategy, we're referring to medication-assisted treatment that's also known as MAT for opioid use disorder that includes methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. And number three, we have recovery support services. Under this strategy, funds can be used to support peer support specialists, care navigators, peer support training, 
or any related resource that supports or connects individuals to services. Next, we have recovery housing. Under this strategy, funds can be used to support programs that offer housing to individuals in treatment, recovery, or receiving medication-assistant treatment. Now, funds can be used to assist with rent, utilities, and deposits. Next, we have employment-related services. Under this strategy, funds can support job training, resume building, interview coaching, transportation to job interviews, clothes, and skills training courses. Next, we have our early intervention programs. Now, this strategy is more focused on the prevention side, and funds can be used to support programs and services that encourage early identification and intervention for children and adolescents who may be struggling with problematic use of drugs or mental health conditions. Next, we have naloxone distribution. Naloxone, that's also known as Narcan, is a life-saving medication that is used to reverse an opioid overdose. Funds can be used to purchase naloxone and distribute in a variety of ways throughout the community. Next, we have post-overdose response teams. Post-overdose response teams are teams that follow up with the person about 24 to 72 hours after an overdose, and they provide support, education, and connections to treatment and healthcare services. Next, we have syringe service programs, which are also called or referred to as SSPs. And those are programs that provide safe use materials, such as syringes, naloxone, or other harm reduction supplies. Next, we have our criminal justice diversion programs. These are often referred to as pre- and post-arrest diversion programs that connect individuals who are at risk of incarceration to treatment or whatever services that they are needing that time. Next, we have addiction treatment for incarcerated individuals. As we early referred to, addiction treatment is referring to medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder for people in jail or prison, which involves methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. And finally, we have our reentry programs. These programs connect people to social and health services as they are being released from incarceration and support them as they reenter society. Okay. Here we have our option B strategies. They are grouped into three parts and are labeled as treatment, prevention, and other strategies. Under each part are multiple strategies, and there are about 112 in all. Some of you may notice that there are some option B strategies that do overlap some of the option A strategies. However, option B allows us the opportunity to explore innovative strategies that we would like to try that may not necessarily follow under option A. Option B also allows for many more prevention and education strategies to try right there at the grassroots. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the option A and option B strategies. I will now turn the ball over back to Amber Parker. Raise your hand if you want Jasmine to go over all 112 strategies. <laughs> Craven County is working hard to get our opioid epidemic response department up and running. The Board of Commissioners budgeted $622,048 in opioid settlement funds this fiscal year. A brand new department was created, a new location was opened on Noose Boulevard, and Colonel Lund joined our team as program manager in October to help manage the requirements of the MOA. The majority of the funds budgeted are for contract services. $17,400 has been budgeted for RAI leading the collaborative strategic planning process. $25,000 was budgeted for the purchase and distribution of naloxone as needed. $150,000 has already been encumbered for a recently executed contract with the Healing Place of New Hanover County. 
This is for the provision of non-medical detox services and long-term recovery for Craven County residents. We're currently in the process of getting contracts established in the amount of $200,000 budgeted for Carolina East Foundation for the provision of a post-overdose response program. And $94,500 is budgeted for recovery housing support to be provided by Reviving Lives Ministries and Hope Recovery Homes. In addition to the opioid settlement funds budget, Craven County has showed their dedication to making real change in Craven County through funding community outreach budget and other efforts that are not connected to the MOA. And Jasmine is going to share some of those with you. Thank you, Amber. Craven County efforts outside of opioid settlement funds are as follows. Community outreach and prevention efforts, Narcan distribution and training, jail navigator located in our Craven County Detention Center, additional sheriff's office narcotics investigators, funding and support of K-9 and DARE programs, $12,000 in funding for Realize You 252 Sober Living House, and $300,000 of funding for Dick's Crisis Intervention Center. You want me to go back to the, your slide? Four. Okay. I will now turn things over to Craven County Manager, Jack Vite. <clears throat> well, I left my script at my table there, so we're going we're gonna to take it off. That's how it normally goes. Um, look. Uh, that slide earlier that Eric went over, the, the one, thank you, the one that should be most meaningful to why we're here is we lost 83 individuals last year, right? It's the motivation of everything that we do on this panel and everything that you do and everything we strive to do because one death is too many to this crisis. And we're going to do every damn thing we can to fix it. So with that said, um, I claim to know everything and my wife corrects me every night. So... I'm going to do something different here. We're going to listen to what you think we should be doing. You heard the resources that are available. You heard the plans that we have. You heard the collaborative strategic planning. And Mariel, if you'll just raise your hand. Mariel, back there, she's with REI. She's helping us get through this, and she's doing a great job. So we want to hear from you. And I'm going to start with municipalities first. Then we'll hear from everyone else. And I, I don't have my list in front of me, but uh, Havelock, I see them in front of me. What, what is it that we can do to help you deal with these issues? Yep. I'm always going to represent the first responders in harm reduction. Sure. Uh, Jasmine's done a great job with uh, Narcan distribution. And I'd say, I told Commissioner Hunt this earlier before the meeting started, I've actually, you know, on the street seen a reduction in overdoses. I think that's pretty attributable to the work that Jasmine and everyone's been doing the last couple of years. So I think you guys are doing a great job. Appreciate it. You guys were sort of the pioneer in some of these strategies yeah, early Chief on. Zacardelli was. Yep. Chief Zacardelli back there. Good to see you, sir. But I mean, you guys were at the forefront of syringe exchange, post overdose response, doing those things. So thank you for that. All right. Newburn. Uh, so we had Alderman Brinson, we had Chief Gallagher with us. What, what can we do to, to help you guys here in the city? Specific to the police department, and sure. um, obviously Alderman Brinson is here that he can provide some additional context. Uh, I provided some comments at the last Board of Alderman meeting specific to crime stats, and um, I talked about the conditions that create criminality. Well, the conditions that create addiction is very similar. And the supply side and the demand side of this problem is one that cannot be solved just simply by putting more deputies and more police on the street, although I will never turn down additional FTEs, and, and I'm sure the sheriff feels the same way. The more resources we have, the more we can impact this problem. But the addiction side, once we have a citizen who is addicted, 
the old adage that just say no is just not going to work. Um, the treatment side and having an opportunity to provide meaningful services to those that uh, need to uh, uh, slay the, the monkey off their back is so critically important. Um, the other side of this is, and I talked about fentanyl, and the amount of fentanyl that is flooding the, the United States <clears throat> and it's finding its way through a series of networks all the way here to Craven County and New Bern um, is one that, that needs um, a great deal of attention, not only at our southern border, but also um, at the county line and the city line. Uh, I believe that the sheriff and I um, have formed a partnership between his staff and my staff to leverage everything that we have that is capable of achieving some success in terms of eliminating really three major components. One is drug distribution, two is gang membership, and three is gun violence. And I think the crime stats have reflected that we're moving in the right direction. But I fear that absent some kind of um, ability to curb the, uh, the demand side of this equation, um, it's going to be a little bit like whack-a-mole. So I don't really have a specific answer to the question as to what can you do for Newburn, um, other than to uh, continue to support the efforts that, uh, that you give to the city of Newburn, but specifically the police department and uh, the sheriff's office. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Chief. Um, one of the things that I learned about through REI was your co-first responder program that you guys have implemented, I think, with... Uh, Name's leaving me, RHA, where you have a sort of social work component along with your policing component. I thought that was a really creative program that you guys were doing. So, it was in crisis. From oh, I'm sorry, we're over ninety percent in our success rate in diverting those that we bring that first uh, that co-responder. Uh, to divert them away from the criminal justice system into the mental health system. And that's an incredible uh, statistic. Um, I thought this can't be true. How are nine out of ten times we're able to, to achieve this uh, success? And it turns out that that's exactly right. The sheriff should not, be, should not run a mental health facility. Police officers and deputies shouldn't have, by their last resort, be, I'm going to arrest you because I have no place else to put you. There are plenty of services out there for persons that are in crisis, and we just have to have the right staff to triage it at the point uh, of service. At that point where that police officer or deputy sheriff and that co-responder can make that determination that the correct destination shouldn't be the sheriff's detention facility, but rather uh, uh, some mental or, 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 or medical facility. Thank you for sharing that, sir. Okay, on the sign-up list, I saw someone from Vanceboro is here, town of Vanceboro. Sir, would you? Yep. Good to see you, Keith. Yeah, we, uh, I'd, I'd just like to commend our, okay. Microphone. I'd just like to commend our law enforcement in, in uh, Vanceboro. They've uh, made some strides in this last month in, in criminal drug activity in our area, and uh, we're, we're really well, we're proud of them. There are a bunch, there's some young guys. They're doing a lot of great things, and uh, I think foremost, I would like you know the county to basically you know help to support that you know, the law enforcement in our area as well as the sheriff's department that are so vital to our area. Uh, that is that's probably one of the most important things I think to he in helping us uh, combat this problem a little bit. Um, also, in our town, we have the Christian Help Center that I think could use uh, a lot of support. Uh, I don't know what uh, kind of funding can be uh, pushed their way, uh, but if nothing more than uh, training uh, and some help with supplies and that kind of thing, and training on how to distribute things, it could be maybe a distribution center. I don't know. There's some things that can be done there. Uh, Christy Arrington, I think, is the uh, chairman there running that program. Uh, Todd McMillan, I think that uh, he's uh, also Alderman McMillan, McMillan in uh, Vanceboro. He's the chairman of the board there. Um, 
And I also, I also am a part of the Vanceboro Rescue Squad. And, uh, you know, of course, the continued adequate funding of the rescue squads throughout the county, Vanceboro and all of them, is, uh, is, is, a, is a big need. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're facing, uh, you know, personnel issues every day. Um, I, you know, I've seen this, I've been here 30 years in Vanceboro and in the rescue squad over 30 years. And, uh, you know, I've seen a decline in volunteers to, to just about zero. Uh, we basically rely now, obviously, in our county on mostly uh, career staff, which is, which is in, a, in my opinion, uh, it's awesome because, you know, when I first started EMS, there were no career staff people in the area and you couldn't really rely on the type of service and the type of uh, you know help that you get now from the uh, EMS system and these are just highly qualified people we have some of the best people and uh, as well as Craven County and Havelock and uh, I think you know they're doing a bang up job and uh, I'm, I'm really encouraged by these uh, these these things the, the items that are on these pages and uh, I think the one in particular that I'm really encouraged by is number eight, the uh, post overdose response team. I think that's one of those things that uh, it's going to have, that's really going to have to happen better by, at some point because, you know, we as rescue squad, we take the people to the hospital and uh, we see these people over and over again until they die. And it's, it's just a matter of time most of the time. And uh, basically we do, we see them, you know, week after week, sometimes day after day until they're gone. And uh, that's, that's usually, I think that's, that's going to be one of the biggest things, I think, that this can do is to try to help there. And, uh, and I'm encouraged that things are happening in the, in the, in the uh, jail system, the prison system, that you know, people are being uh, reached there because I think, you know, obviously you got you to you get people there to talk to. I mean, they're there. So I think that's uh, it's good. So without being too long-winded, I appreciate it. Thank you for this program. Thank you for the folks that are working real hard at that. It's my first time here. I'm, I'm excited about what, what you got going on. Keith, we're glad you're here. And you and I agree on a, one strong point is that post overdose response, and I was looking for Deb in the audience. I saw her come in, but she knows it's one of the passion points, and I know it's one of hers. And there's a lot that can be done uh, when we identify who's overdosed and get to them quickly, right? There's a lot of resources we can develop. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, any other municipalities that I've overlooked here? River Bend, Trent Woods, Cove City, Dover, Bridgeton. One once. All right. Let's open up the county commissioners. Any any thoughts, comments? Okay. Yes, sir. Commissioner Booker. I just found it uh, interesting. Uh, Denny Booker, county commissioner. When we looked at that chart that Eric put up there that showed 2022, I guess, or 23, whichever, that showed the tremendous spike in heroin and fentanyl, it, it occurred to me that all this money we're getting is for, from the prescription drug companies and what they did. And now our deaths are not from prescription drugs, there were some, but the majority of them were on that spike that went almost off the chart. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think the chief mentioned the southern border, and um, I, I just happened to watch a documentary last night, a 30-minute documentary of a young Arizona State University co-ed sophomore who came home at Christmas time and ordered a Percocet online, which was stupid, and she died that very night. She took half of it, and she died that night. And her father's on a, on a campaign now. They live in California. But my, my point is, we somehow, we don't have any control over what comes into this country through Mexico via China, I guess, is where it starts. But to me, that's the, that's the really big issue. And you recall uh, a year and a half ago in Wilmington when one of the speakers said, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. Can't do it. We have to change mindsets and change 
we got to change the demand. We got to stop the demand. We got to get people to understand. And that, to me, that's the big ch big chore you've got ahead of you, is to stop people from doing what this young woman did, buying a Percocet online, so she thought, and ended up dying that night from op from fentanyl. So, I don't know what that comment means, but uh, it means uh, a lot because you said three things. One is one of Jasmine's first taglines was "One pill can kill." And that's exactly the point you made. Second thing is, until we figure out the southern border and stop the flow of fentanyl into this country, the sheriff and his law enforcement community are continuously going to be dealing with these statistics we got up here, just like our EMS partners and our hospital partners. And lastly, you're exactly right. You can't arrest your way out of it. I heard that same statement that day, and it really sat with me and continues to, to sit with me. So, And speaking of the sheriff, um, I saw him behind you. Uh, Sheriff Hughes, oh, Commissioner Mitchell, first before we go to him, did you want to say something? I'm sorry, excuse me. No. So, I'm E.T. Mitchell for anybody who doesn't know me, and I normally introduce myself as the designated drunk. Um, I will have 26 years clean and sober in February. Now, my demon was not opioids, it was tranquilizers and scotch. But, from, but substance abuse is substance abuse. And talking about the, the post-overdose intervention programs, people who are addicted do not wake up one day and say, hot damn, I got a problem, because it's their solution. You have a very short window to catch them and get them the help. And so I encourage the post-overdose recovery programs because that's your window, and it's short. And it takes months and years to adapt to a substance and get up and go to work every day when you're addicted to something. Those aren't those people on the wrong side of the town. There are a lot of them who look just like me, I promise you. Um, so if it takes months to adapt to something, it takes months for your brain and your life to adapt to something back to normal. So we've got to have long-term recovery programs, because it's not just one person. It's their families, it's their kids, it's their jobs, it's the whole economic structure that connects them. So I appreciate Jasmine and Eric focusing on long-term options. I appreciate long-term, I appreciate law enforcement for focusing on intervention center systems, because that's what we're going to need if we're going to get a handle on any addiction program in this county. Thank you. Commissioner Mitchell. Any other commissioners before I move on? Sheriff, I gave you a few extra moments there to think about that, but um, again, we're aware of all your activities out there and your team and what you've put together trying to tackle this. So just some words from you, sir. On yeah. What um, you on. First of all, you know, exactly what the chief said. Uh, one, uh, his office and my office are working better than ever before. Uh, we are accomplishing so many things. The men and women of our offices are dynamic. They're dedicated. Uh, they're very passionate about what they do. And they see a lot of things that many people don't have to see day in and day out. The amount of narcotics and the people, bad people, who bring this poison into our county and share it in our schools and sell it to our neighbors and our family members, um, we're removing them at, a, at an astronomical rate. The, the years of prison time that these folks are getting in the federal system and state system. Uh, a lot of it we thank our district attorney Scott Thomas because his team aggressively prosecutes these traffickers. Not the folks that are caught up in addiction that need help. And once again, like we've mentioned, no, we can't enforce our way out of it. Our job now is to make it so difficult for them to operate here. Unfortunately for them to choose another place but our focus is Craven County. And we work together every day, and our team members do that. I think a lot of credit should go to our commissioners and our county managers for realizing we do have a problem in the jail. You know, this is, every sheriff will tell you, none of us are mental health professionals. We got this by default. We've got to focus on that. Y'all have made the investment into a jail navigator. I am going to put her on the spot and ask her to say a few things about the great things, if I've got time, Please. I'd like to defer to Tammy. The great things that they are doing in there, the differences we're making, the success stories that we have now, 
that we didn't have two years ago and the work that they put into it every day to address the needs of the folks that are incarcerated. And, and I'll tell you, the folks that come into our jail that are trafficking and dealing in narcotics, I have zero tolerance for them. Those that are in there because of an addiction and they truly are sick and want help, we're making sure that every resource we have available in this county and statewide is at their disposal. That's what she does day in and day out. So I would like for Tammy to say a few things. Please. That's all right. Hi, I'm Tammy Munson. If for you that don't know me, I'm the jail navigator. Um, so thank you. I know Commissioner Hunt's really passionate about what we're doing here. So what we've been doing as of late, we do have the GED program. So that's one of our biggest success stories right now. We've had two inmates actually get their complete GEDs inside our facility. They started and finished their GED program inside Craven County. But what we're doing now is so we have Hope Recovery. They are located in Moorhead City. And we have peer support specialists. They come in three times a week. They meet one hour with each block, so we separate by blocks, and they teach the wellness wheel. So it's a six-month program that they teach down in Moorhead City, but they bring it inside our facility because I know that I spoke with Mark from Reviving Lives. We don't have enough bed space. I think, Mark, how many did you say we have here in Craven County? 43, 43 beds in Craven County for recovery homes, and that's just not enough. So what we're doing is we're trying to bring recovery inside our facility. Also, who works with Mark, um, he has Laura, who is one of the only forensic peer support specialists. The only forensic peer support specialists. So she, we've been working along with her because she, got, she received her recovery in jail. So she's very passionate about that as well. So we're trying to create a relationship with Reviving Lives, bring some of her experience, some of that lived in experience to those in our facility. So with Hope Recovery, we're doing recovery classes. We're trying to work with um, the district attorney to find those. We go through the jail list every day. That's my biggest job is I go through the jail list every day and I identify those with lower level bonds that the district attorney, maybe his ADAs won't be so uh, resilient to let them go out. They go out on an ankle monitor and they go out and they go for six months. And we've seen a lot of success with Hope Recovery. I think it's one of the best ones we've seen around here. Um, so we have, a grad, we have graduates, I think, at least once a month, at least. So with all of that entailed, we're doing a lot that we can do, and we're trying to just bring more of the recovery. Um, like I said, working along with Mark, and we, I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Thank you, Tammy. Really excited to have you as a jail navigator moving these programs forward. Uh, we had a couple from people from the judiciary here, our district attorney, Scott Thomas, and our district court judge, uh, Mills, here. I don't know if you have anything to share, any comments. And Major McFadden, I don't want to leave you out there beside him. Dave is running a lot of the, sort of the REI side. Scott Thomas, uh, district attorney. I won't repeat everything the sheriff said and the chief said and Tammy has said, but uh, we're working very closely with them on all those projects, and they're all doing a great job. And for whatever the reasons of, that we have a high overdose rate in Craven County, I can tell you it's not from lack of enforcement because our sheriff's office and our police departments uh, throughout the county are very aggressive. And those cases don't end at charge. They end once we get them to court. So every case that they charge, when you see that they're out there doing good work and arresting drug dealers and drug traffickers, uh, those cases come to the court system and then we're responsible for prosecuting those cases. And as the sheriff mentioned to you, for drug dealers and traffickers, we've got a plan for them, and that plan is a full prosecution and to try to send them to prison for as long as we can. Because oftentimes these are people that we've dealt with before. They're not only involved with drugs, they're involved with violence, guns, and gangs, uh, and they're habitual felons, many of them. <clears throat> but for the ones who want help and want treatment, we have a plan for that too. And that comes through Hope Recovery and some of the other plans and processes that we had in place. Jack, you remember I was on the Craven County Opioid Task Force yes, that we had several years ago, and one of the things that I kept talking about that we needed so much was a jail navigator position, and we, we now have that, and I think we're going to see the benefit from that. I think it's also important to remember with regard to these overdose deaths 
many, many or probably most of them are not even people who are involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, a lot of these overdose deaths, uh, as, as Commissioner Mitchell mentioned, are people that, uh, you know, look like some of the folks right here in this room and are people who don't have a pending case or don't have a criminal case. And so we need to keep that in mind as well. The other aspect of it is our office in the three counties, Carter, Craven, and Pamlico, we're very aggressive on the death by distribution criminal charge. Uh, the prosecutors in my office are working very closely with uh, law enforcement in the three counties. We have a number of death by distribution charges pending right now. And what that means is when we have an overdose death in, Cra in Craven or Carter or Pamlico, uh, law enforcement do ju doesn't just go and uh, chalk this up to another overdose death and close the file. That's not the end, that's the beginning. They open a death investigation and treat it as a, as a regular homicide investigation. We get an autopsy, we have toxicology done. Unfortunately, it takes a, long, a number of months to get that back because the medical examiner and uh, autopsies are so backed up. Uh, but we have that done, we immediately start an investigation, and if we're able to develop the appropriate evidence, we file what is called a death by distribution charge. And we have a number of those pending right now uh, in our district, and we're gonna be even more aggressive on that. And I know for purposes of my office and something that I think would be very helpful uh, if there are any funds available, because we have limited funds from the state for the DA's office, would be to have a prosecutor position that I could uh, dedicate solely to the death by distribution cases because we have to handle these prosecutions in addition to the, the what you would say a regular or normal homicide type murder cases that we have. And I know the sheriff has talked about uh, getting some assistance or requesting some assistance in his office to have an investigator dedicated uh, just to doing the overdose death investigations and a prosecutor such as that uh, in, in my office would be very helpful uh, I know there are another number of other counties in the state that do provide county funds to help provide prosecutors for certain special uh, in, uh, pro projects like that, and I think that would be very helpful. Thank you, sir. On your slide earlier, you mentioned the Dix Crisis Center. Yep. Oh, I don't want that. Do you all have one here, or are you talking about the one in Jacksonville? So I'm going to address that in just a second. If you'll let me finish going around the room before we get to questions, I'm going to, I'm going to hold that thought. Was there anybody else from the judiciary that had any comments before we get to the general public part of this? Anybody else, municipality, anywhere? I'll, I'll be really brief. My name is Walter Mills. I'm the chief district court judge in the county, um, and I'm in my about 11th year doing it. I, I won't restate what everybody said. I mean, I think anything in the court system is a collaboration. There's a tremendous amount of uh, people that work together in different entities. A lot of them are sitting right here. Mr. Merritt is the director of the Department of Social Services sitting here. We all know who the sheriff and Scott are and everyone. Um, but it takes a big group effort. And I'll just say briefly, I have a lot of ideas, but I'm not going to talk very long again. But the Number three on the list, which is funding service providers. I think that, you know, there's eight different courts that we go through as a district court judge. So there's one court is criminal court. A lot of the courts are family courts. And there's not any court that's, this does not exist. It exists in every single court. So there's a lot of different context uh, of where this happens and where it exists in our community. And I get to see a lot of that in those different courts. And, you know, I think our ultimate goal, whether it's uh, the jail navigation with Tammy um, or whoever it is, what we're trying to do is facilitate the person getting to a service provider that has been trained as a professional to help them. That's the ultimate goal. And if that's the ultimate goal, then we may have a survey well, who do, do, who do we have available? I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but who do we have available? What is most effective? And push the funding towards that, whether it's a faith-based community or a service in Vanceboro or whatever it is. Of course, I'm very familiar with Hope Mission because I get to sign a lot of the blue sheets, which is the bond modifications that allow the people to go to Hope Recovery. 
and so do all the district court judges, not just me, of course. Um, but, you know, to me that's vital. And I see a lot of times in court, transportation is an issue to get to treatment. Um, there's just a multitude of complexities. And again, I think we have a common goal. Get the person to the professional that's trained to hopefully help them. Um, and so to me, in the context of the money, that would be a great direction. I think that's it. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, sir. So to address the question uh, from the individual in the back, so the Dix Crisis Center is a three-county partnership between Craven, Carteret, and Onslow. We're equal, somewhat funding partners in that. It's located in Jacksonville behind Jacksonville Memorial Hospital, and it can serve really anyone in North Carolina, but particularly to keep it going, the three counties had to stand it up. So no, there's not a facility here in Craven County, but that facility in Jacksonville is the one we fund. So I don't know if that addresses your question or not. There's staffing issues at the treatment providers. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about getting people before they enter the justice system, is there any discussion about how to prioritize working with um, maybe like NC State or ECU or for internships or partnerships or licensing for, for um, substance abuse and mental health counselors to work here in the county so that we can keep people in our area sure. where you know, in Onslow, because of the military, they're constantly moving out of the area. I don't know if you guys have that same issue here or not as we have. So you're asking a great question about how do you get more people in the profession, right? How do you get more help? And that's something we've talked with through REI. I see my friend from Port back there. I know there's staffing issues. Thanks for coming tonight. And it's a real challenge. And it's not just an East North Carolina problem. It's not a Raleigh problem. It's not a North Carolina problem. It's a nationwide issue. And when I talked with Mr. Merritt, who uh, was identified here earlier, you know, you have the same thing with social work, right? The school of social work at ECU is not putting out enough social workers to meet the demand for Craven County. Not all of East North Carolina, just for Craven County. So it's a real issue. I think that there's going to be a statewide and a regional approach. So I have to tackle that because we've got to build the pipeline bigger. And that's not something I believe Craven County is going to solve on its own, but we're a willing partner and want to have that discussion. So it's a great point you made. All right, I switched the slide. This is for anyone that wants to share any of your thoughts about this crisis, any programs you have, any needs you have, whatever it is, now is the time. So we'll open the floor. Hi, good evening, everybody. William Moore here. Uh, briefly, I'm going to share. I'm here to as a point person for the Recreation Department, City of New Bern. On our last monthly meeting, uh, Mr. Williams was here, <clears throat> and he asked me to follow up. I do have a meeting for the Stanley White Advisory Group at six, so I'm going to head to City Hall. But nonetheless, we want to uh, uh, take a, a, a holistic approach in recreation. They're looking at health and wellness. And part of that uh, connects with this, this strategy. Uh, I heard somebody suggest say no. That sounded cute back in the 80s when I heard, I think, Nancy Reagan brought it out and coined that. But I, I believe until our young people have something <clears throat> of a greater value that they can say yes to, they don't have the ability to just say no. So at part of the prevention, the uh, awareness education piece, <clears throat> that would be a good strategy also. Um, but anyway, uh, the city is saying that they are willing to uh, connect and collaborate uh, as the new Stanley White Rec Center is coming on board. So that would be a, f a facility, a hub that uh, a lot of this uh, can connect with. So I'm going to head to the meeting now. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And for you guys who don't know Mr. Moore, he's very passionate about the subject. I've gotten to know him here recently. And he's got a great story. So I appreciate you being here and sharing with us, okay? All right. Who's next? Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, Mark Devaney. I'm the new, well, new since April, Executive Director of Reviving Lives Ministries. And uh, just last month took over as 
the Craven County Coordinator for Recovery Alliance Initiative as well. Um, just uh, in my time in Craven County, it's only been short, two years, um, but in this last year, I've really learned a lot about the recovery community and, and what we're doing here in the county. First, let me just say, um, I've heard from other counties and other uh, providers in other counties that what we're doing with the collaboratives with RAI and with the Wilmington Treatment Center breakfasts that meet every second Thursday at Captain Raddy's is above and beyond anything they're seeing anywhere else. So this county is great at working together and coming together to uh, attack this problem. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, I believe one of the questions you brought up, Jack, was, uh, was related to the problems as we see fit, um, and Tammy kind of touched on it. Uh, we only have 43 beds in the county right. um, for recovery housing. And uh, that's a solution that I are at RLM, and I'm pretty sure RU252, even though Garrett's not here right now, um, would get behind me and uh, Mr. Moore, who's Houses of Healing, sure. um, and Oxford House would get behind. Uh, we really do need to figure out a solution to provide more beds. One, to take the burden off of our law enforcement, to get them into housing here in Craven County. Um, the other side, too, is uh, I'm not aware of a detox facility in Craven County. Um, and I've been doing this for a little bit. I know we send people to Dix. I know we have some people coming from Wil Wilmington Treatment Center, some people coming from Greenville. <coughs> um, but to have those two things really in the county, I think would really expand uh, the impact that we can have uh, to attack this. And I echo the sentiments for prevention and awareness. Uh, those are definitely some of the big stuff. So thank you guys. Uh, this is exciting. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you sharing. Um, good, good comments. All right. Who's next? All right, Tyler Harris. Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Harris. I'm a volunteer here in the county. Uh, a volunteer with RAI as well, the nonprofit in the Piedmont who has brought the collaboration initiative to this county, bring together all sorts of partners as well that I believe that the county is uh, has a contract with at this point in time. Just uh, a few comments. First of all, I'd like to thank the county manager and commissioners, et cetera, for what you have funded to date. I think those are wise investments from Dick Center, which is a professional detox center, and now providing transportation to that facility on occasion with the CARTS transportation system. And recently, the healing place for longer term recovery, which is what we didn't have before in a very professional manner that's been modeled after other successful programs in this state and others as well. I touched on CARTS. I'd like to thank you for thinking out of the box for the CARTS transportation system, particularly in helping with the substance abuse issue. Those need it in this county. Transportation is a common thread throughout this, this program, and much has been done to help that, that situation. Uh, it was also mentioned about the post-overdose response initiative as well. I'm uh, not sure whether the hospital trustees have actually approved that yet, have they? Uh, I actually spoke with, uh, it's actually through Carolina East Foundation, uh, but I actually spoke with their director today. I think we're within days of getting it signed well, uh, based as, on my report. As was mentioned by my Vance Fur friend, yeah. that would be it's a, a, big a, deal. a great initiative here in this county. Um, just two more things. One is, it's been mentioned about the MAT um, program as well, and MAT in jails as well. Um, unfortunately, those who use the, the MAT program, whether it's methadone or suboxone or Vivitrol as well, there, there is no place for a transitional home in this county for those individuals to find residence with at this point. So I personally would like to see that come about with an initiative in this county to provide that, that effort and hopefully maybe some seed money from the, the budget of the county can be 
used in looking at that is seeing if we have some willing partners with that. And lastly, and probably the biggest thing, is, as has been said by several others, um, not arresting our way out of this. It's the preventative that we are short on in this county. And having a solution for the preventative, there's probably no other organization that could do more to help with this problem than would be our Craven County Board of Education. It is something that I would encourage them to look at what the options are. There's enough expertise here in county government that could provide some alternatives for a willing board. So with that, thank you. Great points, Tyler. Thank you for sharing. One, you know, every, every so often I get a statistic caught in my head, and I share it in times like this, meetings like this, and I know Jeff's back there in the back, and I'm going to say it wrong, but every month Jeff provides a report to the county commissioners. It has a lot of data about applications, but at the end of the first page there's always this little statistic. It's how many children are born with drugs in their system, and it's nine, five, seven, but, but it's, the, it's getting to that prevention. It's dealing with those issues. And, you know, one of the things I talked with Commissioner Mitchell about this recently, you know, there's not a real great place in sober living for women, particularly pregnant women, women with small children, women who are balancing all those difficult things that happen around that time. We haven't cracked that nut yet, and that's one that I think is most important. But it goes to you got to have a lot of different alternatives, right? There's not one solution that works for every human being. And we've done pretty well in the men's houses. we got to start focusing on houses that allow for Matt, houses that deal exclusively with women. And I think when we get, we can crack that nut, we've done something. There you go. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Laquita Corman. I'm with Great Place to Start Behavioral Health Services. Um, I'm actually the, um, the Chief Clinical Director of Operations there. Uh, we're actually, I guess, what I call a, a trauma center. Our specialty is trauma. So when I hear you all talking and speaking about what's going on in the epidemic, um, I'm the why. Um, I'm a licensed clinical therapist, so I'm, I'm the why. I want to understand um, what I need to even, at most times, self-medicate. So um, when we talk about prevention, as um, he spoke earlier, is that we're wanting to be in that place of having our licensed um, therapists be able to serve and, and assist um, in the community and in our jails. Uh, we definitely want to be that resource. And so what I'm asking, when I say the city of New Bern, Craven County, and what we need is to spread the wealth. Um, so often what I've seen, and I, I have to say I was born and raised here as well. So um, money goes into one pot. We usually put our eggs in one area, it's, and it needs to go around. We're, we're a small agency coming up. We've been here four years, getting ready to go on five years that we've been in, in existence, and we're growing. Um, but our heart is for trauma, and that's our specialty. Uh, even for uh, veterans, we're doing trauma-focused um, behavioral health um, uh, therapy, and we're also doing um, cognitive processing therapy. Those are models um, that can serve for anyone that has trauma and also veterans as well. Uh, but one of the things that we're seeing is that we would love for uh, smaller agencies to also uh, get recognized and be able to get some of the funding to help. We cannot push funding in one area because then we're called what we say in our agency is hurting the people because you can't provide treatment one time a month. They have to have treatment more often than one time a month. We have to be able to meet those needs and once they experience any type of trauma, then trauma can lead to substance use. And so we want to be on the end and we want to be able to assist however we can, um, whether that um, be 
in the community or partner with other um, agencies as well. We've been a part of that Thursday meeting as well that's been fabulous. It's been great to see all of the partners and we wanna get on board. So we're in the midst of getting licensed as well. So just wanted to let you all know in the community that there are clinicians that are out there that wanna help, wanna help. But funding is different. Sometimes we don't understand how it works at, to be therapists. Therapists, if you don't come in, we don't get paid. We don't get paid, we don't eat. That's, that's the bottom line. And we have to understand that as clinicians that it's not like a salary base. And we just got a raise this year. Clinicians haven't gotten raised in 12 years, and they finally gave us a raise this year. But understanding that the money that is out there can actually help a lot of the agencies. So those who want to stay and maybe work with an individual one or two hours to provide not only therapy, because sometimes we provide case management, because we want to resource and connect. And so it's important to understand that we want to be there and provide um, those services to our community. Again, we're a great place. Thank you for that. Two, two points. Well, you're in the right place to find out how it works because this is what this meeting's all about. Second, if you can take your services and attach it to one of those 112 different things, we want to talk to you. So that's what this is all about. So thank you for sharing that. We had a tentative stop time at 6.15. We're getting close. Unless I see a hand or somebody jump up, we're going to kind of wrap tonight. Um, look, there's not a more important, what's that? Oh, Dennis, you jumped up. Yeah, hi, I'm Dennis Scott. I'm with Realize U252. I'm the program director there. I want to make two points. Um, just before she, she stood up and spoke, I was going to speak on trauma. Uh, we talk about how do we prevent the, you know, how do we do the prevention and how do we remove the want or the desire or the need and it absolutely is pointing to trauma, and that's what we're looking at now in a larger realm. Another is housing. Um, we at Realize U252, we have our own property, and we're looking to expand on that property to build a campus. It's not a large property, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, we're a nonprofit. We're not sure where the money's coming from. We're just believing for it, and we're moving forward. Um, things like that. Um, um, we're connected with the community and we hear those types of things all over the community with the Oxford houses and things like that, wanting to expand, 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 but you know, us all being nonprofit, being limited. Um, so something like that, um, the commissioner was talking earlier about long-term, we are long-term. We, uh, we have someone coming up on almost four years with us and they're, they're able to stay as long as they need that help. Um, we also have people that come in for six months and they get their program, so to speak, and they rotate out and um, hopefully, you know, move forward with their life. But one thing is trauma. The next is long-term housing, and we're trying to address both of that. Uh, we're not partnering with anyone right now other than Craven and uh, reentry, but we're open to that discussion for, for whoever. And Miss Jasmine Kennedy, uh, Kennedy is on our board, so uh, that's a good connection right there. Thank you. Mr. Dennis, thank you for that. I appreciate what you're doing over at RU252. Uh, to wrap, I was winding up to say there's not probably a more important issue in county government, in any government, in any platform than this one. Um, it's human lives that we're saving here, and that's the motivation. Got a great team here, Eric, Amber, Jasmine, do a Fantastic job, spent a whole lot of time doing this. Much smarter than me and how all this works. And I'm, I'm thankful for all of them and their hard work and putting this together and what they do every day out there. I thank you for being here. Just because the meeting's over doesn't mean you can't still email any of us ideas, suggestions, thoughts you have anytime. It's not just now, anytime. We want to make these programs great and we want to, we want to serve the people that need to be served the most. And sometimes those people can be the hardest to find. So thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, anything on the way out? All right. If the commissioner will stay behind, we'll close out the regular meeting. But thank you. Drive safe and have a great evening.